record. Okay, awesome. Let's get started. So I would like to take this time to briefly introduce you to the Healthy Aging, Al Healthy Aging Alberta Initiative and the Core Alberta platform for those who might not be familiar. So Healthy Aging Alberta is a bi-community, four-community, provincial initiative that brings together a rich network of community-based organizations from across the province that are united by the vision of making Alberta one of the best places in the world to grow older. Healthy Aging Alberta focuses on the development of a coordinated community-based senior-serving sector that is respected and integrated within the broader seniors system of care and can empower and inspire every senior to age how they choose ultimately improving our health and social outcomes for older adults. So there are thousands of incredible organizations in our sector, each offering critical services that support healthy and empowered aging, but we can be stronger together and have a louder voice when united. Together, we can create the bedrock for healthy aging in our province by building a network that connects the sector's organizations. So Healthy Aging Alberta seeks to develop a coordinated sector by bringing together community-based organizations around a common framework for action and with a focus on identifying and addressing priority areas related to healthy aging in community. So this initiative essentially seeks to create a provincial network of organizations that can advocate for healthy aging on a provincial level, share knowledge, and create functional relationships with one another and our allies in health and other sectors. Like a tapestry, we become stronger when we weave our knowledge, expertise, and passion together. So united, we can create more communities where older Albertans are supported as they grow older in their homes, engaged in their communities, and we can build a future we all want and benefit from. And one of these tools that are at our disposal to support the weaving of this network is Core Alberta. So Core Alberta is a sector development tool that has been developed to support this collective vision and strategic objectives of the Healthy Aging Alberta Initiative. The Core Alberta platform is a free member-based digital knowledge and learning hub designed to support provincial sector coordination and strengthening by connecting community-based senior serving organizations to each other and their allied partners. So Core Alberta provides a digital space to share knowledge and capacity building opportunities, allowing members to find and collaborate with others with aligned mandates. So our core groups, like our core caregivers group today, is hosting this event. Um, it's an example of creating learning opportunities that bring organizations from all over the province together. We have over a thousand members today and are growing each and every day. So with, each, with more and more individuals like yourself contributing to this Knowledge Hub, and so we want to thank you for being with us. And with that being said, we have some amazing organizations here with us to share their knowledge and experience in supporting seniors to build resilience against frailty. And so once again, I will hand it over to Angus to moderate our panel. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Cindy. So we're just gonna dive right in. Um, I think Titus, if you don't mind, if you could give us uh, a definition of frailty. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for the introduction, um, I guess. Uh, so I guess frailty, it, it generally is a pretty loaded term, so we can take some time just to unpack it a bit. So generally, um, frailty is known as a, a medical condition of, of reduced function and health. Uh, so really, it focuses more on maybe the body being in a state where it doesn't really have the ability to cope with some of those minor stressors, which normally would have minimal impact. So this kind of definition is what's generally used by the Canadian Frailty Association or Canadian Frailty Network um, and in a lot of medical spaces. So even in there, right, there's a lot of medical terms or reduced function, um, you know, your, your state that you're in. So generally at SAGE, we we generally use a bit of a, an analogy to kind of describe frailty to folks, right? And so we generally think of frailty as like a continuum or a path, right? So you have folks that can move into frailty or they can move out of frailty. Um, and you can also think of it like a journey, right? Um, we like to use the analogy of like a hiking trip, right? Where, um, you know, we're all on this journey. Um, and for some folks, sometimes frailty can show up and build up slowly one thing at a time. So think like, um, you know, in terms of nutrition or oral health or memory challenges or social isolation, you can think that along this journey, these things slowly show up one at a time. Um, and you can think of them like bricks in your backpack that slowly get added over time. And it really, 
over time starts to make that journey along that path quite difficult, right? So for some folks, it gets to the point where sometimes maybe a small bump in the road, right? It might feel like a mountain for them because they're, they're just carrying so much weight, right? In that backpack of theirs. Um, so that's kind of how we understand frailty and kind of unpack it is that it's not really just this one medical thing, but generally this overall um, kind of journey that you can be on. And I think the important thing with this kind of way of understanding frailty too is that it isn't necessarily something that's um, permanent or unmanageable, right? So for some folks, they are able to, to make those lifestyle changes and take those steps to slowly remove those bricks from their backpack um, and to kind of lighten their load, right? To help them continue on that journey. Uh, but for other folks who maybe they're not in a position to make those big changes, right? And they can't really necessarily remove those bricks. Um, they're still able to kind of use those tools and supports, you know, think boots or hiking poles or a good rain jacket, right? They're still, uh, you know, um, this might look like having good connections to a doctor or maybe good family members around them, right? Um, or a good service provider that they trust, right? Um, they can at least rely on these supports to keep them on that journey and to bear some of that weight. So um, that's kind of how we generally explain frailty at stage, right? Is just making sure that it's a continuum, right? That and a journey that folks are on and that it is something that um, can change over time and that folks do have control of. Thanks, Titus. That's uh... A pretty broad definition. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, obviously, there's a lot of components that that play into it. Um, and speaking of those, um, Karen, do you have um, any idea like how is frailty assessed? Yeah, and actually, the easiest way for me to do this is just to see where is my share screen. And hopefully, can everybody see that? Um, let me make it a bit bigger here. So there is a clinical frailty scale that is generally used. And um, when looking at this, you can see here there's nine different stages. So it starts from somebody who is very fit. Um, and then the levels go fit, uh, managing well, living with mild frailty, and it extends to um, to severely frail, and then some of them only go to the seven, and then there's other scales that actually go to the nine, which is terminally ill. And Can you make it a little bit bigger, um, Karen? Sorry. Bigger? Uh, let me see. Is that big enough for people now? Can you see it? Need to go bigger than that? We're good? Oh, okay. looks good. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, so say we're looking at um, very fit here. So this is active people, they have energy, they're motivated, um, can exercise, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're generally fit. And this scale is used for people kind of 65 and older, although it does kind of move around a little bit as well, um, depending on the other areas. So you can be somebody who is, say, well into your 80s and very fit and everything is going really well. Or you could be somebody who's maybe in your 60s and due to um, situations that you have going on, you might be less fit. So frailty really has nothing to do with exact age number. It's something that's important to look at. It's where you're at. And there's a lot of different elements to this. And when this is being assessed, you generally look at it as what was the person's condition about two weeks before the deterioration started. So what were they doing at that time? So um, could be no active disease. I mean, I'm not gonna necessarily read all of these and we can definitely share this um, with the comments at the end, but um, it's basically going from you're fit, you're active, you're managing well to, um, to number four is where you're starting to maybe need a bit of assistance. Um, to go through. And then mild frailty is uh, that slowing down, needing assistance, um, living with moderate frailty again, maybe you need some help with housekeeping and things like that. Um, and then number seven, severe frailty would be completely dependent on other people. Um, and um, here, I like that this particular chart also includes people with dementia and basically looking at it that 
when somebody is assessed with mild dementia, it generally works around the same as what you would think of as fit or managing well um, frailty. And then it can increase this from there. So moderate would be equivalent with moderate frailty and severe dementia um, would be the more severe level of, um, of frailty. Um, Titus, I know you use this scale and you've been through the pilot project and everything. Is there anything that you wanna add in what you've seen? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Karen. I, I, I guess for the frailty scale, um, in terms of how we've been using it at Sage, right? Because it is, the frailty scale does tend to be a very clinical tool, right? Generally used in um, acute care settings or more medical settings, right? So um, it, it is important to know that some of these things, you know, some of those levels don't necessarily only look at those physical indicators, but also there are some signs of those like mental health pieces and some of those other psychosocial pieces, right? Um, just for example, like um, number six, right? Living with moderate frailty. Uh, we've come across folks where maybe mental health has been a big challenge for them. And maybe the issue really is that they're really struggling with the motivation, right? And, and, and um, you know, they say that they can't really bring themselves out of bed to do some of these tasks, right? So sometimes it is really important to understand some of those mental health pieces and also the amount of support around them as well, right? Are they living with family or are they living on their own? Um, but we've found, um, we've, we've had varying degrees of success at SAGE using the tool. Um, and yeah, it's, it's definitely something that um, social workers and social service organizations can definitely use as well. Very applicable and relevant. Okay, so before I move on to uh, Melissa, I just have a question um, regarding like how it says that frailty is, it corresponds with level of dementia. Um, so is one is one motivating the other, or or is it the other way around? Or I mean, I know you mentioned something about uh, people who maybe are having mental health challenges um, are struggling to do things they would normally do, and that's not necessarily because of frailty issues. So if you take the mental health component out, um, how is there a corresponding uh, effect there between frailty and dementia? Dementia uh, also, oh, go ahead, Titus, you wanna answer that one first? <laughs> go ahead. Sure, thanks Karen. Um, I guess in terms of dementia too, like the, the focus of the clinical frailty scale, sometimes it really does focus on function, right? So for someone with dementia, they might have say a moderate or mild level of dementia, but they're still able to do those, um, you know, independent activities of daily living, right? They're still able to get groceries and do some banking. Um, so it really, the focus is on function, right? So the, the dementia doesn't necessarily exclude them from some of the levels or necessarily place them on some of them. Um, yeah, at least what we've seen at SAGE as well too. So it's more of a cumulative thing than the dementia is going to affect your, your level of frailty if, if it's affecting your level of movement in the first place or, or nutrition or what have you. Yeah, and, and dementia as it progresses does affect your motor skills. It does affect um, your eating. It does affect various other elements that are physical um, as well. So again, when, when it's getting to the point of being um, it kind of categorized as severe dementia, that is quite often a person who they don't have the physical functionality anymore. Um, maybe they don't have their language skill anymore. So there are different elements as well as the cognitive. And that's one thing I think with frailty that's important to look at is this is more than just a physical thing. This is a functioning. So that, that's your mental health, that's um, your nutrition, uh, everything else goes into frailty as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, Melissa, like how do seniors feel when they're being presented with frailty issues? I mean, do they find, um, I mean, does it scare them? Is there any kind of stigma attached to it? Like how, how do you find that they're reacting to those concerns? Yeah, that's a great question. <sighs> Gaining a sense of understanding of how another person feels I think we can see a lot of signs 
of how they're feeling by just watching a person's behavior in the moment. What is it that we're seeing about uh, the people we care about taking on or exploring a new opportunity on the horizon? Okay, so I'm going to imagine this like a moment in a story, okay? The opportunities on the horizon, think of it like a cruise ship, okay? We are on the shore and we're looking at this new opportunity that we have for greater well being, whatever that may be. A person's mindset is kind of their character at the moment, it's not a permanent thing. It's a momentary thing, and it can depend on a number of factors, how the person slept the night before, or the time of day, or the mood. So let's have a look at a few different kinds of characters at the moment, looking at this opportunity at the horizon. First, we've got the Mr. Explorer. His mindset is called a growth mindset, and this is what he looks like. He's got Titan, we don't know how much is in his backpack, but we can imagine all these characters might have the same amount of bricks in their backpacks. But Mr. Explorer has lots of energy at the moment. He can perform whatever it is he wants to do. And he's satisfied that this is a good opportunity. So he's boarding that cruise ship regardless what's in his backpack. Then we have Mr. Dispositional. And maybe you know someone who demonstrates this character very often. It's in their disposition to uh, accept or reject certain things without a lot of contemplation. And, and you'll hear these people saying things like, I don't, I won't, I can't, I can. They're identifying with their character as if this is what I am and am not. And for that kind of character, they'll maybe identify with um, whether or not they can or cannot board that cruise ship. And they might say something like, I'm too overwhelmed to handle that at the moment. I can't handle that at the moment. In which case, you know, there's always going to be a whole bunch of handouts and information about the cruise there because these mindsets are um, momentary and transient. And then we have Mr. So you can imagine Mr. Disp Dispositional is giving you all kinds of body language about whether he's rejecting something, the arms are crossed and, and that's fine. Then the third character, we have Mr. Deliberation and he's genuinely thinking about how to get there there's something stopping Mr. Deliberation from just running up towards that cruise line. There's a thing stopping him. He's deliberating. How do I come into this experience? There's something stopping him. So Mr. Deliberation at the moment may be open to exploring what kind of guide is going to help tackle those struggles and help them move forward so are, are are there instances where um like a prognosis of frailty brings further deterioration despite whichever mister they may be yes there's instances where just re simply receiving the diagnosis nothing physically has changed other than the awareness of the diagnosis and now where bef 10 minutes before we, that person was feeling like Mr. Explorer who could do anything and was limitless is now realizing that he might be Mr. Deliberation who realizes there's, there are gonna be a number of things I'm gonna have to manage in order to be successful or it might be so overwhelming, just the awareness of that being part of his or her character that he might start to feel overwhelmed and need to be just coping with that awareness. So I see the stages of grief playing out. 
all the time when someone receives their diagnosis. And it really is a matter of knowing that there's a right time and a right place for everything. So sometimes with best of intentions, people want to have physiotherapy, but we don't catch the right moment for Mr. Explorer to take on the opportunity or it's Mr. Deliberation isn't here at the moment. And then it's just being aware of all of the emotions that maybe need to be processed before a person can be of enough peace of mind to be open to taking on um, an, an opportunity and seeing it as an opportunity. Because when we get a diagnosis, we're coming to the fact, we're coming to the awareness of our own vulnerability. So how can we not feel all kinds of feelings and fear is one of them. And it is very difficult to move forward when we are struggling to accept vulnerability and are resisting maybe because of that. So yeah, it's that just really, it's a delicate sense. thing, finding the right time to have the right conversation. And um, no matter what the conversation is, helping it be a positive, supportive conversation where the person feels better afterwards. So you mentioned the word diagnosis a number of times, and I have to say, um, like I'm a caregiver for my mom who has um, mobility issues, which is probably verging on frailty, but I've never actually heard that a diagnosis of frailty is a thing. So I would ask the panel, I, like, is it something that um, medical professionals are hesitant to tell people or are they quite straightforward about it? Like this, this is, I mean, I know frailty exists. I've just never it, heard of anybody actually diagnosed with it. Yeah, I think that we can point out people's limitations in, in physio. Um, when people start physio, they're often addressing a particular domain of the frailty spectrum, what like low, low grip strength sometimes, uh, mom's lost weight, mom's feeling exhaustion. So we're bringing forth that vulnerability into the light. Mom's not as active as she used to be. Mom's slowing down. So maybe we're not bringing the full spectrum of, of frailty into the light, but we're bringing com one component of it into the light as the topic of discussion. Karen, can you shed any light on that question? Yeah, I, again, it's, it's, it's a spectrum. And um, you, you'll hear people saying, so and so is seeming more frail, or there's elements of frailty. But again, um, and it, Titus, being from with the frailty area, particularly, you could probably answer this more like for the work that we do. It's just something you recognize that there's somewhere on that spectrum. Um, and, uh, and just being aware of it, but not necessarily a diagnosis of frailty. Yes, it's not a blanket thing. <clears throat> yeah, Titus, I don't know. If... Yeah, I might, I might add, um, yeah, those are very good um, examples. I might add to for, for frailty, because it is such an overarching term, it often acts as kind of like a springboard into other topics, right, that underlie uh, that kind of vulnerability, right? So. I know oftentimes um, with seniors, we see some of them, if we're in touch with their um, primary care providers, I know with the primary care network, they have like a frailty assessment team that really looks at things like nutrition and diet, and then also some of those physical things, um, physiotherapists, all that. So often it's not so much a diagnosis, rather it's kind of that gateway into a bigger conversation. Uh, at least that's what kind of I've seen so far. So while you're, while you're actually heading in that direction, can you tell us some of the signs that someone's approaching frailty? Like, is there anything, I mean, we know we've mentioned slowing down, um, inability to do tasks that they might've been able to do before. Are there other signs? Yeah, uh, so the Canadian Frailty Network does have a pretty helpful resource on this. Um, and I think they point out five key signs of frailty. Uh, or five categories, right? So the first is weight loss, um, unintentional weight loss. The second would be fatigue. 
um, then low activity level, then a loss of strength, and then slow walking speed. So those are kind of the five big signs. Um, if you'd like to break it down even further, you know, there are examples like, um, you know, maybe an older adult, you know, or, you know, tells you that they're they're not able to complete tasks in one go without resting, right? So one example is things like washing the dishes, right? Maybe they have to take a break and sit, right, in the middle of that, and they're not able to do it all in one go. Um, you know, difficulties getting up after sitting down. Um, you know, they're struggling to carry groceries and um, stuff like that, or light groceries even. Um, so those are just kind of some things that you can watch out for. And at Sage, we generally kind of use those as prompts to uh, enter into that bigger conversation of, oh, like, and you know, I noticed you mentioned this. Is it okay if I ask, like, have you also been experiencing this, or how are you managing when it comes to things like housework or cooking? Are you able to do those things? So generally, it's those small signs we look for that kind of help us um, come into that bigger conversation about how they're doing overall in terms of their function. Um, yeah, whether it's things like, you know, are they okay with managing medication on their own? Are they able to get groceries, right? Do they, um, yeah. And are, if there's any kind of flags that are being raised in those areas, that's kind of generally those signs we look for. So uh, I, can't, I can't help but think like maybe 20 years ago, just as a ballpark figure, um, most people would have just called this getting older. So now, now we've we've put a new term around it, and and is it making a difference? Like, are we able to offer better supports and services as a result of actually looking at this as uh, a condition rather than just an aging thing? Yeah, I would definitely say so, right? Because again, it 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 makes it um, like Melissa said, right? It's definitely an, a choice that that um, it, it requires a mindset and a kind of a shift in that, right? Where, um, you know, frailty is something that naturally happens to everyone as they get older, right? There's that myth that, oh, doesn't frailty just mean getting old or aging, uh, which, you know, there definitely are a lot of people, right, older adults who um, are functioning very well, right? Are able to do a lot of things on their own, right? Whether it's with the help of supports or with the help of a family member or, um, you know, good connections, but they're still able to maintain some of that independence and kind of do those things on their own um, and kind of fend off frailty, so to speak. Karen, do you have anything to add to that? Karen, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, sorry, I think it's my internet that's unstable, so I'm sorry if I'm going in and out. Um, but yeah, for sure, it's one of those things that you, you look at it and um, even looking at the term now, um, welderly, which are the, the well elderly. Um, so there's assessments of people who are well into their 90s and they would not be classified as being frail at all. They're still in their 90s. So age wise, they're still there, but they don't have anything that would put them um, maybe anywhere above a one or a two on the frailty scale. Um, so again, it's looking at the situation for, uh, for what it is. And, um, and again, I know that somebody put in the, uh, in the chat here earlier, when you're dealing with things like addiction and mental health, um, and I know for us with caregivers burnout and things like that, you are um, putting yourself or being put in a risk of frailty. Um, because you're not eating as well, you're not keeping up your health in that sense. And that just leads to everything else. So again, um, it's really looking at this as a spectrum, as different areas, and that it's not linear. Uh, you can improve your health. Like if you go in for surgery, and, and even for one of us that we like to think we're still young, um, and we have a little, we have trouble for a little while after the surgery while we're recovering, but we do recover and continue to be at a level that we were before the surgery or before we got sick. Um, so again, it's, it's not looking at this as a linear thing that you're heading in one direction. So there's not necessarily a timeline from welderly to um, elderly per se. 
like from being well and then all of a sudden you know you start to experience frailty and then you immediately go down the scale or up the scale as the case may be yeah and and where you are on the scale also is is how well you're going to recover when an incident occurs um so just like stress um general health status, these types of things, when you are fairly high and you, you aren't at frailty, you aren't at um, a health deficit, something happens, you're going to have a little bit of a blip there. If your frailty level is, um, is a little bit deeper, so you've got maybe physical, nutritional, uh, mental health issues, cognitive, various things, it's going to take a little bit longer to recover. And your recovery might not come back as far. Okay, that, well, that makes sense. So that's that's not a bad segue into it, Melissa. So how do you address, um, you know, how are you proactive in addressing frailty in your clients? That's a great question, because really our our aims are to support ourselves and practice self-care moment to moment, right? We don't know necessarily how our health is going to change in any given time. So our best opportunity to seize control of our health is moment by moment. So I'm going to talk about a conversation that I would have with someone to gauge what, um, what their present state of being is, and then support that state of being, whatever it may be. And so I've taken the stage of change model and just simplified it for my own purposes, because the simpler I can make things, the easier I can keep doing them. Like this is a self-care ritual, but it's also a ritual I use in my practice to help others. So it's three letters, A-H-A. So the first letter is ahead. Looking ahead, what opportunity do we have to live life to the fullest? So where, looking, it's like, because I'm always thinking about being on the beach, looking at the horizon, what is our opportunity right now to support ourselves? The second, do we want to explore that? asking permission, like whenever we're coming into another person's moment, do you want to explore that? And there you'd, you'd gain a sense of a person's mindset, whether their growth mindset, whether their fixed mindset, you don't have to ask them their, your, their response to that question that giving them permission to explore it or not, their behavior and their response will tell you where they're at, where it really at that moment. So just taking a look, if they're in a fixed mindset, is it dispositional? Is it attaching to the identity or is it deliberational? And then if they are of the, um, explore a mindset great let's take it on let's explore what would that look like the h part of aha is what's happening what's happening when you're living life to the fullest right now what do you want to do let's do something fun great um we're moving our body or whatever it may be self-care ritual let's explore that for the person with the deliberation mindset so What's stopping you from, from getting there? People can answer their own questions with very little guidance if they just have the opportunity to, have, to answer their own questions. So when people say, what's stopping me is um, something physical, you know, and they'll identify what part of the frailty spectrum is limiting them the most that's the thing, what they see as holding them back is what they are willing to more likely work on. So if they're feeling exhausted, then that's where they want to spend their energy. We might see low speed of walking. We might see low grip strength. We might see a whole bunch of things, but I don't want to overwhelm that person by going in three different directions. I'll just follow their lead. 
if if exhaustion is the main limiting factor, then let's come up with something worth doing that's simple enough that helps generate that happiness that because a lot of people go for a walk just simply because it feels good or they'll dance because it feels good like what do you want to do that might help with that energy right now and follow that person's lead yeah you know because we're teaching them how to guide and how to trust themselves with everything we do we're teaching them yes you can yes you can and 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 you you giving them the responsibility that they they deserve to really own that journey. So it's a combination of looking at where they are and, and offering them opportunities to empower themselves. Oh, to, yeah. To move beyond it. Yeah. You know, when I meet people, I could do all kinds of things, like give them assistive devices and we could address all kinds of safety barriers and stuff. But um, initially, people, to get a little bit of momentum, momentum they're see of early right like if they're doing something that they genuinely want to do and they genuinely will feel the benefit of that then they're more likely to keep doing that thing and that's behavior change when it feels good I mean it addresses the person's biggest struggle from their mindset they're more likely to want to do that thing again so how do we do that when you've got a dispositional mindset who says well I can't Okay, it sounds like there's a whole bunch of uh, feelings of overwhelm um, that you're facing right now. So it's completely okay to allow the person the opportunity to express what their feelings are in a way that feels right for them. So often I'll hear people express all sorts of frustrations that they're having with things outside themselves. And as an outsider, I think, well, maybe there's a self, like maybe the frustrations are within, but we're giving ourselves the opportunity to express them instead of shaming them. So when somebody's in a dispositional mindset, I feel that it's my greatest opportunity to see that person as they are in the moment, give them the opportunity to express how they're feeling in the way that feels comfortable for them. And then my greatest role is to make sure that I honor and admire what they did to support themselves. Because expressing your feelings is is self-care too, right? And gaining a sense of trust, no matter what they are. So the third part of aha uh-huh is admiring what people do on the stage of change, not in an action state of change, not judging them if they're not there, but admiring what they do to support themselves, no matter where they are on the state of change. Maybe they contemplated something today, admire that. Maybe they tried something today, admire that. Maybe they expressed some frustrations that they don't have the energy at this moment admire that because then you then you're reinforcing that they are owning this journey and they are taking leadership and they are doing what they need to do to help have well-being self-care moment to moment right okay so i'm gonna take what you just said and uh ask titus if you can Tell us how you're addressing these same concerns with the Dragonfly program at Sage. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess for the Dragonfly program, because we are a pilot project, we do take a little more, uh, we do have a bit more of a structured or rigid approach to addressing frailty. Um, so once a senior, uh, once we, we screen them for frailty and if they do kind of fall in that frail range, um, then we kind of start with that discussion, right, on kind of those overall wellness pieces to look at um, what are some of those strengths, right? What What's what's helping you manage these things when you're not able to do these tasks, right? Do you have a friend that you're comfortable calling or do you have a good relationship with a doctor, right? So we really look at some of those strengths that are in their situation, but then we also look at some of those pieces that um, could use some improvement, right? 
Um, so through this kind of initial conversation, we would set goals with them, right? And just to, to see, okay, what are some things that we can work on over this next time period? Uh, so as part of Dragonfly, we do support seniors for up to a year because a lot of the goals we are working on are a lot more long-term and more lifestyle changes, right? So they do require a lot more time. Um, and the thing too is that we do do a lot of health education um, as part of our process too, where we are chatting with seniors a lot about um, what does wellness mean, right? And what does it look like? Um, and even though, you know, like we are a social service setting, so we aren't necessarily medical professionals at SAGE, but um, a lot of seniors, sometimes they are a lot more comfortable chatting with say a social worker or a counselor uh, rather than a doctor, maybe who've had negative experiences, right? So sometimes it is important for us to um, maybe ask about some of those medical pieces, not necessarily um, in a medical way, but just to see like, are they, do they have access to certain medical resources? Is there something that they're struggling with on the medical end that maybe we can facilitate some of those linkages too? Um, so pharmacists is kind of one example, right? Where sometimes we do have seniors struggling with frailty who do bring up issues about, um, oh, I'm not quite sure how these medications work or the dosages. I also don't know when to take them, right? So for there, we would maybe ask, oh, like, do you have a pharmacist that you're comfortable chatting with? Do you have their phone number on your fridge, right? Do you have home care involved helping out? Um, so it's really looking at uh, that holistic picture of wellness from our end at Sage of the physical health, but also that mental health and those social supports they have. Yeah, and one thing I, I do want to note too, in terms of like the outcomes that we see when we're addressing frailty, is that not necessarily everyone is able to reverse frailty, right? Because it is a journey that looks different for everyone. As Karen said, it's not linear. Um, but for some folks um, who are, you know, in this especially stressful situations, um, you know, we still at least provide them with some of those tools and resources to self-manage and feel like an active participant, right? Because the one thing with frailty and addressing it is we don't want it to feel very prescriptive, like um, they're waiting for doctors to do things to them, right? And for a nurse to do things to them and, and prescribe whatever it is. It's that we're empowering them to be part of the process, right? And, and like Melissa said earlier with her acronym, right? It's really looking at, um, are they ready to kind of make some of those changes and kind of walk along that journey and kind of take out some of those bricks, right? Or to, or to use some supports and lean on some of those existing people in their networks. Um, so that even if the outcome isn't, you know, um, really ideal, they're at least better prepared to kind of manage on their own and feel a, a sense of um, being in control and independence. So it's about giving them options essentially mm -hmm. for how they want to proceed. Um, and I just want to ask, uh, like, how does someone access that Dragonfly program? Um, so unfortunately, we are um, nearing the end of the, the program at SAGE. Um, but of course, as, as new initiatives come up, especially in the social uh, sector, um, I'm sure there'll be other programs popping up. But unfortunately, we are kind of at the end of our program. So we're not able to take any new referrals at this point. But going forward, it would be on a referral basis? Um, I'm not quite sure. I can't really speak to anything at Sage specifically that's concrete right now. Uh, we are still screening folks um, for frailty and kind of seeing if we can, um, maybe if it's like a one-time thing, right, where it's just one aspect that they need assistance with that's really contributing to frailty. Maybe our social worker is able to help, but that long-term dragonfly support, unfortunately, we aren't able to, to accept referrals at this time. Still good, good info, Titus. Thank you. So just a, a last question for Karen. Um, I think you touched on it briefly. Uh, how are caregivers uh, any more susceptible to uh, frailty issues than anyone else? You're on mute. Yeah. There we go. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things that caregiving for many people can be very stressful. It can be stressful um, physically, emotionally, and these are all things that take a toll. Um, I know self-care is a, is a big issue for, for caregivers. Just take stopping and thinking about what are you doing for yourself? Um, I'm tired, but I keep pushing through. Um, I hurt, but I keep helping to, to lift my care recipient. And realizing that 
kind of what Titus was saying, you need a circle of care. You need to be able to have other people to lean on. You need to, uh, to use the respite if it's there, use home care if it's available. Um, if you need to have somebody go into a, uh, a facility for a little while so that you can recover, that's okay. So it's really um, learning that, uh, that caregiving can be a very, very long process. It can go on for years and years. And the last thing that people want is to actually end up in a situation where they're um, talking about frailty, we'll say they're more frail than the person that they're caring for. So, um, so yeah, I think for, for caregivers, it, it really is, it's, it's being aware, being aware of what's going on and finding those, those resources um, and those supports as early on as possible so that you can continue this journey. And if you're getting to the point that it is too much um, looking for alternatives. Which of course is part and parcel of why we're here today in order to help people with this. So uh, we've got some, a little bit of time left. I'd like to open the floor up to questions. If you wanna either put something in the chat box or raise your hand or just blurt something out, I'm sure our panelists would be happy to help you out. Don't see any hands up. So I'm going to go ahead and ask a question. Hello, it's me. Oh, hello, okay, hello, hello. Ours. Hello. Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I also have this uh, kind of um, funny internet. Um, yes, um, I was going to ask or comment on something that has been said, and that's the identity. Um, let's say the identification with somebody's Ill with one's illness, right? Which can be um, definitely a barrier to addressing um, things that might improve that person's life, you know? So this all being, um, when we don't have any significant cognitive um, issues like such as a diagnosed mental illness or dementia or the like, so then I find that is super important if, um, I think it was the physiotherapist saying that, that when we can intervene in that identification process, you know, if I'm not my diabetes or I am not my, my um, lupus, so I am not what's happening to me, that is helpful in addressing that altogether, right? To open the doors and find supports for those people, be it a physiotherapist, be it um, social support, be it anything. But I think we had um, at the Sage Senior Safe House, we had a few clients, but they really have a lack of motivation because of that learned helplessness. And so even going by that to even transfer people for counseling or any of that thing. So it definitely opens a door to recognize in that patient what's happening and why the beliefs not to do anything about one's um, disability or mobility issues Right. And I think that's where we come in as first attenders, right? Like as a physiotherapist. Yes. Let's and, say. Yeah. Sorry. And I noticed this in my career as well, because the average age of my client is probably 85. So uh, if I had a dime for every time someone I met said, I can't do that because I'm 85. Like people sometimes even identify with their age as being a limiting factor. And, um, I think that when somebody identifies directly with anything, I have not had a lot of success changing their mind directly in the moment, but that's why the value of resources can be so important. Like uh, this is, I've been a physio for 15 years now. And for the last two years, I've spent a lot of energy just making my guidance accessible anytime, anywhere, like video content, putting it on demand, talking through my feelings and my thoughts, putting my own personal journey out there into the light, because I don't know when the best opportunity is for that person to address it, but it might be indirectly. It might not be. They might watch something and find a guide and it might take them a lot of observing to observing other people's successes particularly for them to believe 
that an opportunity is indeed possible. I think it depends on how many times um, the person has identified with the limitations of whatever that thing may be. It might take a lot of exposure to opportunities in order to truly think it's possible. Yeah, I think you just addressed what I was going to ask, which is, you know, how do you deal with people who are just obstinate about uh, not admitting they're, they're in that frailty phase um, and not just wanting to do anything about it, no matter how bad it gets. So is there is there anyone else who has any questions for our panel? Any last remarks, perhaps? Sharon says, the best tool I've used is the technique of motivational interviewing. Mm. That's something that, that we do just with our caregivers in general, whether there's frailty or, or anything is, what level of motivation do people have to, to change the situation that they're in? And, uh, and definitely that plays right into what Melissa was saying about where people are at and you've got to meet them where they're at. Um, and recognize that, so for sure. Well, that makes sense because how else do do they develop trust that you're not just, you know, looking to fix them. You're looking to actually help them help themselves, which is maybe what it's all about to a certain degree. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, and I would say that sometimes people's biggest fear isn't the real fear, whether that be fear of falling. Sometimes the, the fear is more failing being embarrassed, failing themselves. And so that that can have a lot to do with the readiness. Like the 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 process of building trust is never instantaneous and it it has its own timeline, right? And that could be a downward spiral once they get into it of, of sort of when you haven't talked to someone for a long time and you keep letting it go because it gets worse and worse, the more you think about, well, it's far too long now. I can't I can't call them. I can't talk to them and you'd be the same kind of spiral. And Sandy is saying that she found the pandemic has really increased the frailty of several family members that were stuck in their house and isolated, which has led to reduced mobility and activity. I think we can all sort of relate to that to a certain degree when, let's say in uh, June or July there, we couldn't even go outside, mm -hmm. uh, even if we wanted to because of the smoke and the heat. So there's so many different things that are affecting this um, whole frailty continuum that it's, uh, it's a challenge and a half. Yeah. So, and I, I think people don't realize how big of a piece isolation is. That isolation, um, I mean, the, the stat that you should put out there is, is equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day and what it does to your health. So isolation is a huge element that's playing into frailty and everything else that's going on as well. So yeah, for sure. So I'm afraid we have to wrap up. So I just want to really thank our participants, our panelists for all your expert um, knowledge and your wisdom today. And for those people who contributed, thank you as well. And for all attendees for being here today, I hope you got something of value from this session. Thank you to our tech support as well, Cindy and Cynthia for supporting us and allowing us to be part of this incredible series. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. And I just put our event survey in the chat box, uh, the link. So we would encourage you to fill that out so that we can uh, better understand what uh, you enjoyed about today and what we can do better moving forward. Um, as I mentioned before, this is the first session of the Core Frailty series. So we would love to have you at our upcoming sessions hosted by our other core groups who will provide the other perspectives on frailty that were mentioned today, such as frailty and nutrition and physical mobility, frailty and ageism, and many more. So please check that out. I will leave the link in the chat box as well. Lastly, if you have not done uh, already done so, please check out Core Alberta at corealberta.ca and create a free membership to stay in the loop. We will be sending out an email with the survey link again, uh, the recording and contact information of our panelists. So thank you so much to our core caregivers group for organizing the panelists. I can't thank you enough for being the hosts for today. And then also thank you so much to our panelists for sharing your wisdom and knowledge and stories. I, I know I learned a lot. So thank you so, so much. And thank you, everyone. Please have a wonderful rest of your day.